Hi everyone, welcome to the third video in our gases unit. This video is going to be all about the ideal gas law and the different applications that we can calculate um, or that we can use the ideal gas law for. Um, this is sections 10.4 to 10.6 in your book. Um, so not only should you watch this video, but you also should make sure that you read those three sections in the book just because I don't necessarily hit every single concept that's in the textbook. So what we're going to start off with is we're going to start off with the ideal gas law. Um, at normal conditions such as standard temperature and pressure, most real gases, which are gases that we encounter every day, behave qualitatively like an ideal gas. Um, generally, gases behave more like ideal gases at higher temperatures and lower pressures. Um, and we'll talk more about why that happens later. Um, but it is important to know that generally a gas behaves more like ideal at high temperature and low pressure. So with the ideal gas law, um, this combines all of, it says the above, but these are all of the gas laws that we looked at in the previous video into one equation or one relationship. And so the ideal gas law is PV equals NRT, Pivner. Um, this is probably going to be the gas law that you will use the most. Um, this one's going to be the most important because this will also tie into stoichiometry. So just a reminder of all the variables, P is pressure, V is volume, N is number of moles, uh, T is temperature in Kelvin, and R is the universal gas constant. Um, your pressure can actually be in a variety of units. Um, the unit that pressure is in is actually going to be dependent on the value of R that you use. Um, you have a variety of, of values on your equations and constant sheet, um, but pressure can be in either ATM, KPA, or TOR. Volume needs to always be in liters, N is always in moles, T is always in Kelvin. So with values of the gas law constant, um, what I've done here at the top is I've used the standard temperature and pressure values to derive R. So I used one ATM for pressure, 22.4 liters, that's molar volume for, for the volume, N is one mole, T is 273 Kelvin. Right? We have STP, we have molar volume. If we multiply this and we divide, we actually get 0.08206 liters times atmospheres over mole times Kelvin. This is the value of R that we typically use. Um, you may have used 0 0.0821. We're actually going to take it out to four significant figures now. Um, this is the value that is on your equations and constant sheet. Um, typically, this is what you'll use. So if pressure is an ATM, this is going to be the value of R that you're going to use. Some other values of R. Um, if you're working with calories, which was, doesn't happen very often, but if you are, uh, your value of R is 1.987. If you are working with joules, um, which is actually the same as um, working in KPA for pressure, you use 8.314. So if pressure is in KPA, you use the 8.314 liters times KPA over mole times Kelvin. Or if your pressure is in TOR, use 62.36. Notice again, you may have used 62.4. Um, however, we're going to keep it to four sig figs. So depending on what your pressure is, your value of R could change. Um, you are given this value of R, the atmospheres, you're given the KPA, and you're given the TOR all on the equation sheet. So you don't have to memorize these, you just need to know where to find them and how to use them. Uh, the most important thing to remember is your units must cancel when using this equation. So it, that's why if pressure is an ATM, you need to use this first value of R. If you're in TOR, you can use this last value of R. Um, if you prefer to keep pressure in ATM and you want to always convert your pressures, that's fine. I don't care. It's up to you. So what we're going to look at is we're going to look at other applications of the ideal gas law. Um, so the ideal gas equation can be stated in other ways, which actually will incorporate other variables um, while still keeping the same general relationship. Um, so, for example, we can calculate the density of a gas 
using the ideal gas law. And we can calculate the molecular mass of a gas or the molar mass. Um, but first, we can actually look at the molar volume looking at the ideal gas law. Um, just a reminder that the molar volume is the volume that's occupied by one mole of a substance. Um, at STP, molar volume is 22.4 liters. This only applies at STP. Um, if we are at standard temperature and pressure, you can use stoichiometry and molar volume to convert between liters and moles. So this just gives you another conversion factor. So instead of going grams to moles, you can go liters to moles, use the mole ratio, and go back out to whatever unit that you need. Um, if we are not at standard temperature and pressure, okay, the balanced equation tells us relative amounts, tells us the mole ratios, um, but we are if, not, if we are not at STP, we cannot use molar volume. So what we actually have to do is we have to relate volume for gases using the ideal gas law. So if you are given pressure, volume, and temperature for, let's say, oxygen gas, and you need to know the volume of hydrogen that's needed to produce two moles of water, you have to actually use a stoichiometry problem where you use the ideal gas law to get the moles of, in this case, oxygen, then you use the mole ratio from the balanced equation, and then you use the ideal gas law again to get to hydrogen. Um, again, this is if we are not at STP. If we're not at standard temperature and pressure, we have to take into account pressure, temperature, volume. Um, if we were at STP and we had that same problem, we could just use one mole is equal to 22.4 liters. So this is where stoichiometry is going to start to come back into play, um, and you will start using stoich much more again. So with finding the density of a gas, um, think about how you calculate density. Right? What is density? And well, density is mass over volume. So somehow, if we want to calculate the density of a gas, we need to find mass over volume. Um, if you take a look, if we rearrange the ideal gas law, we actually can get N over V equals P over RT. So we actually get moles over liters. We need grams over liters, right? The density of a gas is always given in grams per liter uh, because gases take up so much more space. So here we have moles per liter. So we're not quite to density yet. So what we need to do is somehow we need to convert this moles to grams. Well, how do you go moles to grams? using the molar mass. So we know that moles times the molar mass or the molecular mass is equal to the mass of the substance. So N times capital M. So it's important to distinguish between these. Capital M is molar mass. Lowercase m is just the mass of the substance. So for example, you know, water is 18.02 grams per mole. That's capital M for water. The lowercase m is whatever your your sample size is. Um, so if we multiply both sides by molecular mass, we actually will get the equation m over v, so grams over liters, equals pm over rt, so pressure times molar mass divided by r times t. So what this means is density equals PM over RT. So really all you need to know is the molar mass okay, or molecular mass, right? The pressure and the temperature. All you need to know is the molar mass, the pressure, and the temperature, and you can calculate density. So see if you can come up with some fun saying to remember D equals PM over RT. Right? Something to remember that. Um, and so this is calculating the density of a gas. Now using this density equation, uh, we can actually solve for molar mass. Right? We can actually now get this capital M by itself. So if we do some more manipulation and some more rearranging, we can actually find the molar mass. 
So to calculate the molar mass of a gas, all we need is the density, R, T, and P. Now, a way to remember this, and it's corny, but you're going to remember it. Let's pretend that we have a molar mass kitty cat. Right? So we have a molar mass kitty cat. Let's say its name is Moly. I don't know. Um, well, the way to remember this is all good cats put dirt over their pee. Right? DRT for dirt, P for pee. So all good moly cats put dirt over their pee. Um, what this does is this gives us a way to calculate molar mass. Let's say you didn't have density. Well, what is density? Okay, density is grams over liters. So we could actually replace that if we don't actually have density and get lowercase mrt over vp. But you can remember dirt over p, you can always calculate for density. So this is how we can actually manipulate the density equation um, to find the molecular mass or the molar mass of a gas. Okay, so we've now looked at calculating density and calculating molar mass of a gas just using the ideal gas law. So now what we're going to do is we're going to look at um, another way to calculate pressure. Um, so the ideal gas law is just using P, V, N, and T um, and calculating for something at conditions that aren't standard temperature and pressure. Um, Dalton's law of partial pressures isn't used as often, um, but it will be very convenient when you calculate the molar volume of a gas in the lab. So Dalton's law of partial pressures says that the total number of collisions is based on total number of molecules. So collisions is pressure. So pressure is based on the total number of molecules. Um, collisions from one kind of gas is based only on that kind. So each pressure is based on the specific gas. So the total pressure of a mixture of gases is the sum of the pressure of each individual gas. And that is called the partial pressure. So here's going to be Dalton's law. So the total pressure is equal to each of the partial pressures of the individual gases. So if you have a container that has five gases in it, each of them have a different pressure, the total pressure is going to be the sum of those. And there are two applications that we can use with Dalton's law. Um, the first one is looking at um, mole fractions. So Dalton's law can be stated in um, a slightly different way by looking at a single component of the mixture. So the partial pressure of one of the gases is equal to the number of moles of that gas over the total number of moles times the total pressure. Okay, so the ratio that we have here, the N gas over N total, so the moles of gas one over the total number of moles, is called the mole fraction. It's symbolized by a capital X. Capital X represents mole fraction. It's almost like percent composition, right? It's the number of moles that you have of a single gas over the whole. So it's like part over whole. Um, by substituting this mole fraction into this top equation, we actually get the partial pressure of the gas one is equal to the mole fraction times the total pressure. Um, and this makes sense because the total pressure depends on the total number of moles of gas that are in the container. So the second application of Dalton's law is collecting gases over water. This is the most common way to collect a gas. Um, you use water displacement as you're collecting the gas. Um, so for example, this diagram shows um, collection of oxygen gas by heating potassium chlorate. Um, so you heat this up, the gas actually goes through the tube into the container that's flipped over um, into the bucket of water. Um, so a gas that's collected by water displacement will have some water vapor mixed in with the gas. Right? Because you're bubbling the gas through the water, you'll always have some water vapor up here. Um, but since we only want the pressure of the gas, 
what we actually are able to do is take the total pressure that's in this container and say, well, the total pressure of this container is equal to the pressure of the gas plus the pressure of the water vapor. Um, this is the, the same process that you'll use when you calculate molar volume of a gas. Um, and so when you're looking at water vapor, um, you have those values in Appendix B in your book. Um, so you used Appendix C for heats of formation and everything. Now we're going to look at Appendix B. Um, that's page 1099 of your text. Um, and so you can actually find the water vapor pressure, which is based on the temperature. So the total pressure when you collect a gas over water is equal to the pressure of the gas plus the pressure of the water. Um, that is another way to use Dalton's Law, um, just to find one of of the partial pressures. So solving gas law problems. Um, you've already encountered a variety of gas law problems. Um, sometimes you're looking at just pressure and volume. Sometimes you're looking at the ideal gas law. Sometimes you're looking at you know four variables. Um, so it's going to be really important that you use strategies to make sure that you're solving the problems correctly. Um, so there's actually a section in your textbook on page 410. Um, it's called Strategies in Chemistry, um, and it takes you step by step through solving these variety of problems. Uh, but just to kind of summarize, what you want to make sure to do is read the question carefully. Okay, Label all of the variables in the problem. So if you are given two pressures, make sure you label them P1 and P2, or P initial and P final. Um, and make sure all of your variables correspond. So if you're given an initial pressure and an initial temperature, make sure that those are both P1 and T1, and you're given a final temperature, make sure that's T2, and you're trying to find P2. Right? Make sure you label them correctly and determine what you're trying to find. So look at the problems that you're given, see what you're given and what you're trying to find. Um, if you're only given one of each variable, you'll probably be using the ideal gas law. If you're given two pressures and one volume and asked to find volume, you're probably going to be using one of the simple gas laws. Um, and then what you want to do is convert any units. What I mean by convert any units is immediately convert Celsius to Kelvin. Before you even worry about the, what the problem is asking for, convert Celsius to Kelvin. Um, if you have grams, you're probably going to have to go to moles. Um, so any units that need converted, make sure to do that. And then determine which gas law is required and just solve the problem. Um, so hopefully this helps as you go through gas law problems. And as we work through more gas law problems in class, um, hopefully you'll get much more confident and comfortable with uh, solving gas law problems.